Very good. Hello, everyone. We're just going to let the room fill up before we begin. Giving it one more minute. I think we can get started. Um, my name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Hall Cross Library. I'm really delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Professor Brian Shayette, who will be in conversation with Rabbi Howard Cooper on Professor Shayette's latest book, The Ghetto, A Very Short Introduction, which we are delighted to be launching this evening. The term ghetto is an extraordinarily complex word that encompasses Jewish history, black experiences in Northern America and our contemporary sense of cities and countries segregated by race and class. In the first chapter of this very short introduction, Professor Shayette frames his study around deceptively simple questions about the term and its complex history. He writes, quote, the slipperiness of ghetto as both place and concept should not be underestimated. Does it just apply to a particular ethnic or racial group? Is it a term of abuse or resistance? A way of understanding commonplace urbanization or a unique form of racial segregation? Is it a profound indication of how people are divided along class lines in the global metropolis? Or is it merely a superficial aspect of global culture, popular music, fiction, film, and fashion? Few can decide whether the term is old or new, local or global, ordinary or extreme, end quote. Exploring the various identities and uses of ghettos, Professor Shayette shows how different instances of ghettoization and interrelate across time and space. Before I introduce our two speakers, just a few notes of guidance and, and housekeeping on how the events usually work. Um, this event is being recorded, of course, but your video won't be, uh, won't be appearing in the, in the recording, which will be loading on YouTube. If you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the chat at any time. We're going to have about 40 minutes of formal in conversation between Howard and Brian, and then afterward we'll be able to take uh, questions from participants. Um, if you require captioning, please, um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a, an option to select uh, more in the ellipsis, and you can toggle the subtitles on or off as needed. And if you have any technical difficulty, please feel free to send me or my colleague Leah, who's also on um, helping us with the technical uh, side of things. So if you have any issues, we can try to help. Now to introduce our speakers. Brian Shayette is Chair in Modern Literature and Culture at the University of Reading and a Fellow of the English Association. He has authored or edited 11 books and is a series editor for, editor for Bloomsbury, New Horizons in Contemporary Writing. He's lectured widely throughout the United States and Europe and has held visiting positions at Dartmouth College, the University of Michigan, my old alma mater, and the University of Pennsylvania. He also holds fellowships at the University of Leeds, Southampton, and Birkbeck College, London. He reviews fiction for several British newspapers and has published nearly 100 reviews on film, history, and fiction for the Times Literary Supplement. And Howard Cooper is a rabbinic graduate of the Leo Beck College, 
a psychoanalytic psychotherapist in private practice, director of spiritual development at Finchley Reform Synagogue, and the author of books on Jewish psychological and spiritual themes. And so with that, I hand it over to Howard. Thank you, Christine. Well, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to have this conversation with Brian uh, about the book that he's, he's written. I was uh, very drawn to something that he said in Brian that you said right at the beginning in your acknowledgements of the book that it was great fun to write the book now I in my experience that's a very unusual thing for an author to say that it's great fun to write a book so I hope we can capture some of that fun as we proceed and share some of your ideas uh, this evening uh, really I'm seeing my role as a facilitator to give you an opportunity to to review and expand upon the themes of the book. I'm going to take us through uh, the book sort of chronologically, but we're completely free to have fun and go off on any byways and diversions that come to us in the, in the conversation. Because as you rightly and under, rightly say, the, this notion of the ghetto is a protean, unstable term. And I think one of the things that you do in the book is to really bring the, uh, Christine quoted the word slipperiness, which is a great word, of this term. Um, you brought that to our attention. So to start us off with the early history of this term, because as you write, uh, there were Jewish quarters before the term ghetto. So let, let's hear something about that. Yes, uh, um, there were certainly Jewish quarters in uh, throughout uh, the European continent for the uh, medieval period, uh, for for lot for many centuries. Uh, also in North Africa, play, uh, they were called Mela in some North African places, but uh, um, Jews were also quartered. Um, in North Africa as well. This wasn't unusual. It wasn't just Jews that were quartered. Uh, all uh, foreign uh, um, merchants of all kinds and tr foreign travelers of all kinds were also quartered. Uh, um, and there's no question that there is a connection between these medieval Jewish quarters and the Italian ghettos. Uh, and most of Western Europe didn't have ghettos. We have to remember a, a number of things. G ghetto has a very bad press. Uh, I think early ghettos has a very bad press for most Jewish people. They assumed that they were prisons. They were assumed that they were very harsh. They assumed that they were uh, uh, totally imposed on Jews in, in Italy. Um, so there's a lot of uh mythologizing of the of uh actual ghettos on the on the italian peninsula um now italy uh wasn't then um yeah um so absolute connection between jewish quarters and the italian ghettos in that they were small communities uh quite often they were regarded as holy communities. They were known as New uh, Jerusalems quite often. Uh, they had all kinds of infrastructures, social in infrastructures, questions of taxation. They were, they def definitely became the model for the Italian ghettos. But the key point, we have to remember that the Italian ghettos were a compromise. Virtually the whole of Western Europe had expelled Jews. Uh, this culminated with the uh, Spain in 1492 expelling its Jews and then the forced conversion of Jews in Portugal in, uh, five years later, which meant that the, the whole of the Iberian Peninsula after a millennia was more or less emptied of Jews. The ghettos were a compromise. The Italians did not uh, want to expel its Jews. And yet there was a lot of pressure to somehow manage them, to not let them roam freely. And this pressure of, came very much from the Catholic Church and local priests. And so 
uh, the ghetto, a place where merchants could travel. Uh, they acted as warehouses in the way that they uh, had done traditionally. Uh, but I, I've calculated there were 24 ghettos. It, it depends how you think of these Italian ghettos. Sometimes it was just the street. Well, I don't regard uh, a, few, uh, a few hundred or less than a hundred Jews as a ghetto because it didn't have the infrastructure that all the main ghettos had. So, yeah. So would you, would you say that the confinement of Jews into particular geographical areas also enabled a certain kind of creativity sometimes in the, let's say, let's talk about the Italian situation. Would that be the case? Yes, and it was mainly it Italy. Obviously, there are a few key exceptions, Frankfurt and Prague, uh, Joseph Hoff and, uh, and the uh, Judengasse, a few exceptions, but it was mainly Italy that, that inst instituted uh, across the, the whole of the peninsula. I say the whole of the peninsula, it was north central because Spain uh, um, were the rulers of southern Italy. So Spain expelled its Jews in southern Italy as it did uh, in, in uh, the Iberian um, peninsula as well. But it led to, there was all kinds of creativity. Uh, ghettos were very modern. I think that's the first thing to say. But when we think of ghettos, we tend to use uh, the wrong word. We tend to say medieval ghettos. They weren't medieval, they were early modern. Uh, the first time the word ghetto was used uh, was around the Venice ghetto, 1516. It's the early modern period. Um, they were very much part of modernity, or, or at least um, uh, the growth of modernity in terms of the maritime economies, local taxation, urban planning, and culture of all kinds, professionalization, uh, um, more and more, uh, uh, there were more and more doctors created uh, uh, through the Venetian ghetto uh, than in any other period. Uh, um, women had a lot more autonomy in the ghettos as well. So there was a lot of what we would think of as, as uh, modern uh, factors, but including uh, all kinds of creativity. Uh, the growth of um, the Kabbalah and the understanding of Kabbalah grew up in this period, uh, known as the age of the ghetto. It's about 300 years from the first ghetto, 1516 in Venice, until Nap uh, Napoleon's uh, uh, self-proclaimed liberation of the ghettos in 1789. So it's nearly 300 years. And in that period, there was a tremendous uh, um, growth in Talmudic study, uh, Kabbalah, uh, uh, the role of women in the ghettos. So, uh, so no question, uh, the printing press, uh, book production, the Hebrew printing press, a, a tremendous uh, cultural flowering in this period, mm -hmm. which again, we don't normally associate with the age of the ghetto. We normally associate that with the Italian Renaissance, but uh, many historians, Italian historians would argue that the age of the ghetto was even more of a renaissance for Jews than the age of renaissance. And for those of us who are interested in, in language and words, can you just remind us about the word ghetto, that it, that it took almost a, a century to develop as a term, even in Italy? And then a question, were the, were, did it then, migrate across boundaries into other European cities as a name for Jewish quarters? Yes. Um, so this is still a, quite a contentious uh, story because we're dealing with Italian dialects and we have to remember Italy w w was uh, the least cohesive of Western European nations. As I say, Spain uh, ruled uh, uh, ruled parts of, parts of it. France, the papal uh, um, Rome, and the and the popes ruled other bits. Places like Venice and Frankfurt. Venice was fiercely independent. Uh, Frankfurt was part of the Holy Roman Empire, although as 
was famously said about the Holy Roman Empire, it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. But anyway, um, uh, Italy was very divided. It was also divided in relation to language. So the dialects differed greatly. Uh, um, ghetto or ghetto was a, a, a um, part of Venetian dialect. And it was the name of a foundry, a copper foundry, an island uh, on the outskirts of Venice. A getto or getari means to pour. So pouring molten copper. Uh, there's a strange link here with the melting pot, but I haven't yet got my head around uh, the ghetto and the melting pot. So we'll just stick with the ghetto. So getto uh 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 started as the name of a place it was a noun that's the most important thing a very obscure island on the outskirts of venice getto uh from getari uh, uh um and this is where uh, uh jews were first of all uh, ghettoized uh just around 500 jews they were refugees from the rest of venice as a consequence of um, uh, the many wars that were going on. Uh, there were constant wars being fought. Uh, very difficult for me to get my head around, but there were many, many Venetian Ottoman wars. Uh, this was uh, part of the Italian uh, civil wars that were going on. It resulted in Jewish refugees ending up in Venice for the first time. Now Venice uh, the uh, uh, forbid uh, any Jews, no synagogues and no Jewish presence until ghettoization. So you had all of these Jewish refugees and people didn't know what to do with them. Uh, the authorities didn't know what to do with them. Many were um, tax collectors and bank, what were known as bankers at the time, but it just meant that they uh, were small loan merchants from the uh, outskirts of Venice, part of the, the uh, terra firma, as it was known. So what to do with these Jewish refugees? Uh, they wanted to keep them because uh, the, uh, there was a great deal of impover impoverishment in Venice and uh, small uh, um, money lenders, small bankers were actually incredibly useful for the poorest. Uh, and even not so poor in, in Venice. So they were needed, these, these small bankers. But of course, you then had the priests uh, influenced very much by Rome and uh, a growing uh, counter-reformation, not quite there, but uh, a growing counter-reformation, very vocal in saying that Jew Jews cannot, should not roam freely, that they will pollute uh, Venice. They will pollute uh, the Serenissima, the serene Venice. So the ghetto was a compromise. Jews weren't expelled as they were in the rest of Western Europe, and they were housed on this island, uh, um, uh, the ghetto. Okay. The, there were three ghettos in Venice. So uh, the first, paradoxically, was the old ghetto because it was to do with the island. Then there was the new ghetto, uh, uh, which was formed slightly afterwards as part of the island. But then in 1633, uh, uh, there was a, a, a new, new ghetto, uh, mainly for very rich and powerful merchants who were influential in the Ottoman Empire and uh, had links back to, to Spain, some to Western Europe. So uh, the, in, with the new, new ghetto, it wasn't part of the island. So the ghetto in 1633, so a, a century after the ghetto was formed, moved from a noun to an adjective. Mm, that's very interesting. So, so that's the key point. Mm. Uh, um, the Florence ghetto was 1571. So it, it was, that was the first time that the, that the word ghetto was used in official documents, 1571. And the Rome ghetto was 1555, but no one used the word ghetto until 1589. 
So it took a long time, and it was, after all, just an obscure island. Yeah. Uh, but once it became an adjective, it became a free-floating term and a term used in official documents. Well, maybe that will link us into the themes of your the next chapter, which you called in the book Ghettos of the Imagination, where you really give a survey of the from the end of the 18th century and the, from the Napoleonic era into the 19th century, how this term became more connected with like a state of mind, uh, both in Western Europe and I think in, in Eastern Europe. Tell us something about that 19th century development. So historically, uh, the ghettos uh, are, are about Western Europe and the Italian peninsula in particular. And uh, the Udengasse was never called a ghetto. Uh, Josef Hoff was never called a ghetto. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were at best uh, Jewish quarters or Jewish streets or Jewish alleys. Um, but uh, uh, there was a big change after the, uh, um, the ghettos were liberated by Napoleon because there was a lot of propaganda around the ghettos. When Napoleon liberated the ghettos, he uh, renamed them. Uh, um, uh, the centers of ghettos were known as freedom squares. And the ghetto, the liberation of the ghetto was very much associated with freedom, moving progress, and the new uh, nation states that were beginning to be formed uh, um, or beginning to be thought of, let's say. They weren't formed for much later in Western Europe. So the ghetto was very much associated with medievalism, with a barbaric past, within this kind of propaganda. And so uh, there was all kinds of ways of thinking about the ghetto after, they after the historic ghettos were liberated. The one way they weren't thought of, as we think of them now historically, as in any way modern or uh, um, in any way prefiguring modernity, as I said, in relation to urban planning and taxation, et cetera. So uh, um, in Germany, uh, um, and so and the ghetto was part of the German language from the 17th century, but only really referred to the Italian ghettos. So the word was there, but it only referred to the Italian ghettos. But from around uh, the 1820s and 1830s onwards, there were a lot of popular books that popularized uh, the idea of the ghetto. And ghettos uh, in these popular books, and all of this kind of popular literature was a way of thinking about Germany as a whole, imagining a unified Germany. And what they did was that uh, they had to look at the borders of Germany. And so they looked at the eastern borders and located the ghetto on the eastern borders of Germany. This was, this was uh, the threat the kind of, uh, from the East, uh, the Slavic threat or the Orient, Oriental threat uh, or the Asiatic threat. So there was all kinds of Orientalism that are, of course uh, fed into uh, anti-Semitism as well. All of these books were massive bestsellers in Germany throughout the, the whole of the 19th century. They were translated into French quite early on and the French uh, had their version of the ghetto not uh, on the uh, um, Alsatian border for them. So it was around Alsace. And again, it was a threat for, from French point of view from Germany. The ghettos were also, uh, all of the German literature was all tr translated into English uh, from the 1860s and 1870s onwards. Israel Zangwill, uh, most famously known for his best-selling book. This was a, a transatlantic book published in America, uh, written in England, published by the uh, uh, Jewish Historical Society of America. Uh, uh, and um, Zangwill had read in translation all of these uh, German literature. And so Zangwill did something, again, very different to uh, uh, the word ghetto. Zangwill, uh, for the first time, located it in urban areas. So obviously the East End of London. 
other writers wrote about other urban areas in, in Manchester uh, uh, and, and in other big cities in the UK. This also influenced uh, Abraham Kahan, who wrote about the Lower East Side in very similar terms to Zangwill, and they met each other. And Zangwill, in fact, Children of the Ghetto was a Broadway show, it was very, very well known. So the ghetto went in two directions. It went west, first of all, to America via Zangwill. Also, earlier than Zangwill, uh, there were around 250,000 German Jewish immigrants to America. They brought the word ghetto with them and they hated it. <laughs> uh, everything the ghetto represented was, was the opposite of what they wanted to be, which was good Americans, assimilated and acculturated and good citizens. But they brought the word to America. Uh, Zangwill popularized it. The word, because the word was in the German language, it eventually traveled east as well, through Yiddish and through the German language. And that's why uh, the Nazis eventually, uh, not really until the late 1930s, but eventually started using the word ghetto as well. Obviously in Eastern Europe, uh, there were no ghettos, it was shtetls. And whereas ghettos was, was a name imposed on Jewish townships and Jewish settlements, uh, uh, shtetl was very much the name that Jews themselves gave to where they lived in Eastern Europe. But eventually the word ghetto was also imposed on these areas as mm. well. Before we get to the, the Nazi period, I just have a, a question about Zangwill's romanticization of the ghetto. How do you think about that in relation to the fact that he's writing it also at a time where there must be, like in the East End of London, huge amount of poverty? How do you put together romanticization with a, a Jews who are really impoverished materially? Yeah, so Zangwill, I think, is a very interesting figure in a lot of ways. He's very much um, someone who uh, popularizes. He's someone who takes different traditions and brings them together. And he certainly took the uh, nostalgic tradition and, and all of this German literature and French literature was very nostalgic. It located the ghetto very much in the past, uh, very much in rural Germany. And it tried to come uh, think about Jews and the Jewish past in a way that um, would make them seem to be good citizens. So you did have this nostalgic tradition, which Samuel was well aware of and read. You also had the reality, as you said, the reality of impoverishment and, and um, the reality of all kinds of struggles in the East End, tenement living, uh, um, sweatshops, all of that. Now, Zangwill, uh, wrote about um, the alien Jew, he wrote about sweatshops, he wrote about Jewish, uh, 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 very much uh, Jewish institutions and uh, the culture, the different competing cultures of the ghetto from socialism to Zionism to religious orthodoxy to uh, liberalism. So he wrote about these competing ide ideals, but I think what he really wanted to do, and in, in, that, in this sense, he's no different to the German, his German counterparts, is, is represent Jews as respectable beings. Mm -hmm. It said that the um, 1892 children of the ghetto delayed the 1905 Anti-Aliens Act, the first anti-immigration act in the UK aimed at Eastern Europeans coming in. It said that his book delayed that, uh, for, uh, for, for a decade or, or more. Uh, and Samuel could fill very large venues with thousands and thousands of people. He was a, a very much a public figure, both in the UK and in America as well. But I think he probably erred on the side of nostalgia, or, of representing the Jews in the best light possible. Um, uh, in response to anti-Semitism, in response to anti-alienism. And because I think in the end, uh, Jew, for Jews, uh, 
um, the ghetto wasn't really a place where they were confined or imprisoned. It was a staging post to respectability, to modernity, mm -hmm. to full citizenship. And Zamwell was well aware of that. I suppose that provides a kind of tragically ironic counterpoint to the much darker turn that the term ghetto took in the 20th century in the Nazi period. And uh, maybe we can speak about that now that because you, you, you stress very much, I think, in the book how ghettos were not set up to facilitate genocide but in the end became, as it were, staging posts towards that. So let's have some time on that. Yes. I think um, what I would want to emphasize in all periods of uh, the ghetto, ghettos differed from even within the same environment from place to place. And uh, it, very, it, two ghettos were hardly ever the same, not in Italy, uh, urban ghettos weren't the same, and it's the same applies to the Nazi period. Uh, the Germans, for instance, did never use the word ghettoization. The only time uh, they would use the word ghettoization in German was to do with the formation of individual ghettos. There was no policy of ghettoization. Uh, ghettos could mean different things in different places and at different times, depending on the particular policy. Uh, Jews themselves, uh, from the Nuremberg uh, laws onwards, did think of themselves as living in ghettos, certainly in, in Western Europe. And they also referred back at times to the Italian ghettos. There were many Jews, Jewish leaders, who had written PhDs on the Italian ghettos. So they understood the difference between the Italian uh, history of ghettoization and what they themselves were going through. And uh, Joachim Prinz, who uh, uh, most fortunately uh, left Berlin uh, in, I think, um, 1937, but he, he wrote about uh, what he called the invisible walls of the ghetto after the Nuremberg Laws. The Germans themselves, uh, the policy makers the, uh, of the Nazis, didn't like the idea of, at, at all of ghettoization. They didn't like the idea of uh, um, putting all Jews in one place. Uh, uh, they thought that that would lead to disease. It could lead to uh, political empowerment. They knew that Jews uh, um, thought of themselves as living in a ghetto and, and so didn't want to reinforce that. And so uh, there weren't any ghettos in Western Europe. Uh, what there were were the Nuremberg laws that led to all forms of racial discrimination and segregation. But ghettos were a phenomenon um, in Eastern Europe, Poland especially, and were a result uh, uh, initially uh, of uh, the German invasion of Poland with three and a half million Polish Jews. So from the Nazi point of view, these Jews needed to be managed in some way. A lot were escaping across the uh, Soviet border uh, with the Nazi Soviet pact. Uh, so they needed some form of control and some form of management from the Nazi point of view. They, what they did uh, were, was enclose Jews in already established uh, townships, shtetls. The first ghetto that I write about, and it was the first ghetto, was the uh, Lodge Ghetto. And this became a model for all of the ghettos in Poland. But it was not the same as all of the ghettos in Poland because Lodge very much, uh, um, because of uh, its leader, its dictatorial leader, Rumkowski, became a, uh, what was known both by Jews and Germans as a work ghetto. And uh, Rumkowski tried to keep Jews alive by arguing that they could contribute to the German uh, economy, 
to the German uh, uh, military and uh, make clothes both for the military and for the civilians. And uh, to some extent, it, it, uh, he was successful. The ghetto lasted from 1940 to 1944. It was one of the last, not the last, to be uh, um, destroyed uh, a few months before the Soviet army uh, um, entered uh, Lodge. Um, Romkowski thought that he could keep uh, industrial labor alive and sacrifice more or less everyone else, which he did, including women and children and the elderly. So that was the policy of the Lodge Ghetto. But the actual formation of the Lodge Ghetto uh, to make it uh, uh, utterly escape proof, walled, just a couple of entry, uh, entr entries, uh, um, ruled um, um, with some Germans within the ghetto, but largely by a police force, which was Rumkowski's own police force. That model was then moved onto the largest of the, all the ghettos, the Warsaw Ghetto, which took about a year or more to be formed. 460,000 Jews were incarcerated in Warsaw, and it's the 80th anniversary uh, coming up of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. Was the Warsaw Ghetto, if you compare as I do, the Warsaw Ghetto and the Lodge Ghetto, they were completely different. Just as the early ghettos, Florence, Rome and Venice were all completely different and had completely different ways of, of, of being managed and a, a completely different experience for Jews who lived in them. Exactly the same for, for Lodge and Warsaw, although obviously in extremis. In Warsaw, it was less top down, it was less a dictatorial control by Rumkowski. Um, David Cesarani, the great uh, historian and uh, past director of the Wiener Library, described Warsaw as laissez faire, laissez faire. Uh, so it was much less centrally controlled, it was decentered. There were lots of political organizations that could thrive in the Warsaw Ghetto. It was le much less of an industrial ghetto as well. It didn't become a work ghetto until it was largely, until the population was largely destroyed. Uh, and so it didn't really become a work ghetto until 1943, when there was a kind of rump left of young people young workers uh, and political activists. And it was that rump that was left that led to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, uh, which was incredibly significant, both for Poles in Warsaw and for Jews around the world. And the Nazis didn't realize, but they created the perfect uh, environment for uh, a resistance because as I say, it was mainly young people. It was, uh, and they, uh, um, after the great deportation where the vast majority of Jews were deported to Treblinka, they were left to organize, to uh, train and to get uh, all kinds of equipment so that they could resist. Now, this is a big, big difference between Warsaw and, and Lodge. Rumkowski completely closed down any forms of resistance. So at the very end, when everyone knew that they would be deported to Auschwitz from Lodge, no one could resist. There were no guns, no organization whatsoever. Rumkowski had completely put an end to that. And he himself was deported to Auschwitz and his family. But in Warsaw, they could fight back. And they did fight back because, it, as I say, it was much more decentered, much less controlled. Now, where ghettos became very much part of the Holocaust of the genocidal apparatus, they had a completely different function after the uh, um, Nazi-Soviet pact and, uh, um, uh, was um, betrayed by the Nazis. The Nazis then invaded uh, Eastern Poland and uh, the Soviet Union. Jews then were very quickly placed behind barbed wire and they were largely uh, massacred before they were ghettoized. 
So in uh, that context, Jews and ge uh, the ghettos and genocide did were part of the same story, but it was only really in that context. And it was only once it was clear uh, exactly uh, um, that everyone agreed and uh, on mass killing and mass killing was radicalized and, and uh, turned into industrial killing and the Holocaust. It was at that point that ghettos themselves became part of the genocide. And I suppose that in the last 80 years, in the, in the Jewish imaginaire, the, get, the word ghetto is indelibly associated with that period of history. But in the wider um, cultural sphere, Anglo-American sphere, of course, and I'm moving you on to, your, to another chapter of your book, the word ghetto became associated not so much with Jewish experience, but with black experience in, in the, I want to say so-called ghettos in the United States, because you've got some views about the, the use of the term ghetto in that American context. Can, can you just open that out for us? Yes. I mean, I think in general, when it comes to such a traumatic period of history, the Holocaust for Jews, one quite often can't, um, can't escape the shadow of the Holocaust. And it, it tends to uh, distort, I would say, the way that we think about the past and about, about uh, the ghetto in particular. Uh, um, I think that, um, and I think it's important to show the, compl to complicate things rather than to reduce things to the Holocaust, which we tend to do uh, on all kinds of, of levels. And I think it's very useful in that context to think about uh, different cultures. Um, so for instance, uh, in, in Italy, uh, Jews, uh, um, that certainly from a Catholic point of view, needed to be redeemed. That's also applied to prisoners. It's also applied to uh, um, a whole range of, 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 of other groups. And Jews did wear distinct uh, clothing, but so did a whole range of other groups. So I, I do think it's important to, to broaden out our, 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 the way that we look at things. It's a fact that today, and really since, certainly since the 1960s, um, the word ghetto in America has been much more associated with the African-American experience than any other experience. And, I, and my argument is, is that um, the ghetto for uh, what is known in America, and I'm quite happy to go along with this term, white ethnics, so that would include Jews, that would include Irish, Italians, Hispanics, other peoples, the ghetto was an ethnic enclave. Jews and all of these other white ethnic groups within a generation could leave and did leave. The, uh, and the, I'm talking about ghettos in the large uh, northern cities in America. Uh, I write about Chicago and New York. Uh, I could have written about uh, um, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, I, I write something about as well. Um, but it's the great northern cities. But Jews within a generation could leave. Uh, they became, uh, um, there's a very well-known book called How Jews Beca Became White Folk. And that's the title of a book, a uh, very well-known scholarly work. But essentially Jews were whitened. They were accepted into suburban areas. They were accepted, uh, they were allowed to move outside of uh, the, um, urban uh, centres to the suburbs and did, as, uh, as did the Irish, Italians and, and many other white ethnic groups. The one group that was not allowed to move for more than 50 years were African Americans. And this is purely to do with a form of institutionalised racism in America, in, no in the northern cities of America. So I'm talking about after uh, um, 
uh, over six million African Americans moved from the South to the North, they were essentially contained in urban areas in these Northern cities. There were all kinds of housing and residential associations that simply said, if any uh, African Americans move into my area, if they rent, if they sublet, we will boycott you and we will leave. So there was organized uh, 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 racism and racial segregation for over 50 years, which prevented even well-to-do professional uh, uh, um, African Americans from moving from these areas. It was an it was well equivalent to the Italian ghettos, where uh, wealthy people and uh, uh, impoverished people lived together, as Jews did in Italy. And uh, until the 1970s, uh, um, black people did in America. So, I think. It, we're, well, there's a kind of paradox here because uh, many um, black intellectuals, Ralph Ellison, most uh, dominant among them, who wrote an amazing novel uh, called The um, uh, um, an Absolutely Wonderful uh, Writer, didn't like Harlem, uh, which I write about being called a ghetto at all. Whereas Jews who left after a generation uh, uh, nearby Lower East Side loved it being called a ghetto because it, it fed into a kind of Jewish story, a Jewish narrative of um, moving on, moving up and uh, starting in the ghetto and then becoming professionalized great citizens living in the suburbs. This is a, a, a common Jewish narrative. But African Americans could not move and did not move from around the 1920s until the 1970s. They were truly ghettoized in, in America. And that's my, my argument um, that, that uh, ghettos only really apply to African Americans uh, um, because they were not allowed to leave. And to this day, uh, after the uh, riots in the 1960s, very similar to the riots that um, uh, uh, many American cities have uh, um, experienced in the last few months, the, um, the federal authorities and the state authorities all uh, uh, um, created essentially a black middle class. They allowed them to leave to move to the suburbs and to gain work in a range of state institutions around welfare, around incarceration. Um, and they essentially were, were uh, given, there was a kind of social engineering given a lot of jobs so that a lower middle class and a middle class uh, um, African-American population was created and they then moved to the suburbs. But that was not until the 1970s, whereas Jews moved in the 20s, the 1920s and the 30s. And has that change in socio socioeconomic status of African Americans led to a, the term ghetto being redeemed, as it were, in a more positive way in like popular music and culture in America? Yes, I mean, I, I write, this is thanks to my son, uh, who's in his early 20s, um, Jacob. Without him uh, um, and without a website called Rap Genius, I wouldn't have um, seen the extent to which rap music and gangster rap especially uh, use the term ghetto. Yeah. Uh, when people write about this music, they talk about it being ghetto centric. And uh, there's no question that they, uh, through this music, have redeemed this term and right from the position uh, of what sociologists called in the 1980s, the underclass. So a black underclass was created once you had a black middle class and white flight from these areas, uh, all that were left were the poorest of the poor the underclass, and they, their songs are written from the point of view of the underclass. 
mm -hmm. that, uh, that they feel betrayed by the black middle class and betrayed obviously by uh, uh, the American authorities in general. Um, and it's been redeemed in terms of uh, music, uh, wonderful films, um, uh, all kinds of fashion as well. It's uh, the, um, the ghetto has been turned into this kind of global representation. There's um, ghetto fashion, uh, ghetto fa um, of, of all kinds. And this has spoken uh, to uh, young people, poor people who are feel um, abandoned themselves in urban areas throughout the world. I'm going to hand over to, thank you, Brian. I'm going to hand over to Christine. We, we haven't got a huge amount of time and Christine's going to um, bring in some questions at this point from the chat. Yes, actually, we just got our first one um, from Anushka. Um, so yes, please feel free to uh, post any questions you have in the chat and we will feed them back to Brian and Howard. Um, Anushka is asking, is there something unique about the ghetto itself in comparison to the shtetl, which similarly had its own infrastructure and community? Considering the diversity of the ghettos across time and place, is there a unique characteristic that links them? Great question. Yes, it is a great question. Um, I would say that the shtetl is very much uh, ho uh, wholly a product of Jewish culture. Um, Whereas the ghetto is a kind of compromise, as I said, between Jewish culture and uh, the uh, national authorities in Italy, in Germany, in Prague, Spain, uh, if you go back to various Jewish quarters, um, there, there was some, there was a kind of negotiation there. Uh, shtetls were never, for instance, uh, as they were in Italy, uh, um, closed in and Jews uh, were forced to stay there. They were locked in from the outside and policed so that, so that you couldn't leave from dusk till dawn. Um, so my sense is that shtetls are, are quite different and, and that the imposition of the term ghetto on them by the Nazis, the Germans, or the German language, and then by not the Nazi authorities, uh, um, is something that uh, um, goes completely against Jewish history and Jewish culture. Thanks for that. Um, just looking to see if we have any more. I think that might be the last question. You have some positive comments, of course, that was fascinating, which I absolutely agree with. It's a, it's a tremendous amount of, of history and methodologies and disciplines to cram into <laughs> such a short book, but I have placed the link to purchase the book in the link in the uh, chat. So if anyone is interested, which I'm sure after this uh, very interesting discussion, they will be. Um, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Howard, uh, for leading us through uh, Brian's work. And thank you, Brian, for launching your book with us. Um, and with that, um, if there are no other questions, um, there's lots of now, uh, thanks and um, positive comments coming in. Um, we wanna just thank you again, Brian, and congratulations. And um, thank That's you to cool. everyone who joined us this evening. Maybe More than happy to engage in a conversation if you, anyone wants to email me or be in touch. Or More Twitter, than... because you're quite active on Twitter. I'm well. a bit, uh, yes, too <laughs> active, too active. <laughs> I'm part of the Twitterati, yes. <laughs> the Twitterati, right. <laughs> right. Um, actually, there is, there is one last question that came through if you, if you want to, if we, we have four minutes left. <laughs> we're, yeah. not going to, you know, we're not going to you know, close down the, the, the uh, Zoom room at eight, but you know, we try to keep our events to an hour, but um, if you'd like to take that one and if you've seen it, if there's yes, a there see resentment that. about I, the use of I getting... think it is an interesting question, mm -hmm. and I think there's a mutual resentment, actually, uh, from the uh, African-American side and from the Jewish side, because if ghetto becomes part of your identity, you know, my father, my mother was born in little, uh, um, had a lot to do, wasn't born in, but lived close by to little Jerusalem. My father was, bo was born a Cockney, uh, um, as part of the East End uh, uh, Jewish settlements. Um, and if that's your identity, that they left, they became successful and they, and, and they moved to the suburbs or moved elsewhere, then of course that's hard 
to get beyond, if that's your identity. The same with black people who, as I say, have spent uh, now a century from the 1920s to the 2020s living in these urban areas. Many have escaped, but many like Jews who have a kind of uh, celebrate uh, at the Lower East Side. Many African-Americans are doing exactly the same with Chicago and other ghettoized areas. It's part of their identity. Now, my own position is to move away from uh, what I think of as identity politics and to make connections between different peoples and to move away from that kind of resentment and to see Blacks who lived in those ghettos did refer to the Italian ghettos, did refer to the Nazi ghettos, did refer to the ethnic enclaves. They had three points of references, um, as well as their own experiences. And so for me, making connections across history, showing that history isn't simply about one people, but is about everyone. Um, to me, that's the most important thing I can do. And that's what motivated me for writing this book. Excellent. And Howard, did you have something that you wanted to add at the end? I just wondered whether Brian wanted to um, put a plug in for the panel in December when you're going to be taking up this theme with uh, Daniel Schwartz, who's also written on the ghetto. There's been this resurgence of interest in the ghetto mm -hmm. for historians. Um, do you want to say just finish with that? Yes, there's been a tremendous uh, um, resurgence across all uh, both within Jewish studies, within African-American studies, within sociology more generally, an enormous amount of work uh, on the ghetto. And that's been reflected at, at the Association of Jewish Studies Conference in December, where I'll be on a panel on the ghetto. And I, I'm sure that this is a topic that will uh, be taught um, uh, sadly, I, I, I will have to call it ghetto studies, but it will be taught uh, at universities. I'm already thinking of a course on the subject and many other people are as well. So I think it will be something that we'll be thinking about for many years to come. Thank you very much. Thanks, Howard. And thank you again, everybody, for joining. A fascinating talk. And um, yes, please do purchase the book. Uh, the link is in the chat. And thank you again, Brian. Thank you so much for inviting me and all the work that you've put in. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.